this webinar. Um, and I'm going to introduce Lori. So Lori is the Cooperative Agriculture Pest Survey Program Coordinator at Utah State University. The CAPS program is a federal program coordinated by the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. That's APHIS for those of you that aren't familiar with that. The goal of this organization is to protect U.S. agriculture from introductions of high-risk invasive pests by conducting early detection surveys and providing outreach and education programs that support and enhance efforts to pre prevent new exotic pest entry and establishment. Lori's research and outreach programs have focused on the ecology and management of invasive insects and using bycatch from early detection surveys to learn more about beneficial insects such as pollinators and lady beetles. Lori received a PhD in ecology from Utah State University in 2012 she lives on a cider farm in Paradise, Utah, where her favorite thing to do, I think, I mean, from the size of her orchard, is to grow uh, cider apples. So if you have any questions about growing cider apples, she surely can answer them. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lori. And if you have any questions for me, again, do those in the chat window. If you have questions for Lori, please put those in the Q&A window. Okay, thanks, Megan. Can you hear me? I can, but I... I can't see you yet. I wonder okay. if your camera's off. Did you? I think we turned it off. But... Okay, there we go. You're good to go. Yep. Okay, so um, yes, so I'm Lori Spears. I'm the Invasive Species Survey Coordinator for uh, Utah State University, and I am one of the uh, CAPS coordinators here in Utah. So welcome to our webinar on spotted lanternfly. Um, just click on your slideshow. Yeah, there you go. You're good. There you go. All right. So originally I was planning on uh, briefly discussing other invasive landscape tree pests, such as emerald ash borer. Uh, but considering that um, webinar participants, so you guys are from all over the country and spotted lanternfly is new uh, to pretty much all of us, I thought I would just focus on uh, this one insect and that that way I can go into more detail. So I will cover biology, identification, uh, monitoring, and management options for uh, spotted lanternfly. So if you're interested in learning more about emerald ash borer, an invasive pest that has been found in, uh, I think it's 35 states now with its westernmost occurrence here in uh, Boulder, Colorado, uh, then I recommend that you uh, visit the website shown here, especially if you are on the west coast at where this pest has not yet invaded. Uh, so the site contains a lot of information about emerald ash borer, and there is even a section or a series of webinars on other uh, invasive forest or landscape pests of concern, such as the Asian longhorn beetle. So before we begin, I um, just wanted to get a sense of how many of you have, have traveled um, or have seen uh, this pest in person. So Megan, can you go ahead and, yep, there we go. Yep, I launched it and we'll let people go ahead and vote and then, can you see in real time, Lori, the votes coming in or not? No. Okay, uh, we'll give people another 10 seconds to vote. We got 372 people on the meeting room and about 270 have voted. So I'm going to go ahead and give people five more seconds. Go ahead and get your vote in, everybody. All right. Okay. Can you see the results now? Okay. Yep. So 94% of you are saying no. So that's good. Um, we don't <laughs> want uh, to see this pest in person. Um, okay. So just a quick side note. Um, I am, again, I'm located in Utah. I work for Utah State University. This pest has not been found in Utah, so I don't have a lot of firsthand experience working with this insect. I have traveled to Pennsylvania uh, and visited some of the hot spots, including some of the affected uh, vineyards, and I've been trying to keep up to date on the research. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there, and hopefully I can answer your questions. I did notice that somebody posted in the Q&A section links to um, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Ag, as well as Penn State Extension, and a lot of the information that I'll be talking about 
today comes from those sources. So check, uh, be sure to check out those, um, those sources as well. All right, so, uh, so, so spotted lanternfly is an invasive plant hopper that belongs to order Hemiptera and family Fulgoridae. Uh, despite its common name, this insect is not a fly. Uh, it is also not a butterfly or a moth, uh, despite the similar coloration. And also, uh, despite their common name, lanternfly, they do not emit light. Uh, the native range of spotted lanternfly includes uh, China, Taiwan, and Vietnam. Uh, it is a, um, in its native range, it's not a major pest, but it does attack fruit hosts such as apple, uh, peach, and cherry. Uh, and it invaded Korea in 2004 and Japan in, in 2009. Uh, and then unfortunately, it invaded the US in 2014. So in September of 2014, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture received a report from the Pennsylvania Game Commission of an unusual insect. And this insect was later identified as spotted lantern fly. And it was infesting Alanthus or tree of heaven on a few different residential properties. And I think at least one commercial property in Boyertown, um, Pennsylvania, which is located in Berks County. So this was the first detection of this insect in the US. And it is suspected that shipments of stone from China arrived infested with um, lanternfly eggs. So this is a map showing the current known distribution of this pest. And so that includes eight states. So these counties here um, in blue are where uh, this pest has been reported um, or infestations have been reported. And note that this um, red dot indicates where the initial infestation occurred, and that's in Berks County. And then these orange counties um, up here, there's one in Massachusetts, indicate where this pest has been reported, but not, um, it's not yet considered to be established in those locations. And so in some of these orange counties, um, only a single specimen has been found. Uh, so, for example, I think it was uh, just one dead uh, lanternfly was found in a private home in Boston here in this uh, county in Massachusetts. And it was associated with a shipment of uh, seasonal potted poinsettias. And as far as I know, there have not been any more sightings of this pest in Massachusetts. And so note the quarantine zone right here. Uh, and uh, if you're near uh, these infested areas, uh, be sure to check these quarantine areas frequently. So check with your local extension office or your State Department of Agriculture for the most recent information on what counties are included in the quarantine. So this paper here uh, was published in 2017 and they use climax modeling to predict where this pest uh, may eventually become a problem. And the parameters used for generating this model included temperature, moisture, uh, cold stress, heat stress, dry stress, and wet stress. And this red color uh, here uh, represents uh, favorable locations for spotted lanternfly establishment, whereas these blue colors indicate uh, areas that are less favorable. And so if we zoom in on the US, and I'm sorry, it's a little blurry, uh, but you'll see that spotted lanternfly has a high potential for distribution in uh, the south, southeast and up into the northeast parts of the country, as well as um, some parts of the Midwest over here, uh, whereas the West Coast and especially the Intermountain uh, region where I'm at, that's considered uh, less suitable according to this model. Uh, and the authors uh, found that for the most part, the predicted dis distribution generated by this model matched the current distribution. So using uh, public, or pu sorry, public published information from uh, South Korea, this map was generated to show areas where eggs uh, can probably overwinter. And so I'll talk a little bit more about the life cycle in just a moment, but the eggs are the overwintering life stage. And so here, uh, the lethal temperature uh, for eggs corresponds to the minimum daily average temperature of below uh, 13.9 degrees Celsius. So up here, it states that 
or uh, that's about seven degrees Fahrenheit. So here you can see that the uh, upper parts of the Northeast, um, parts of the upper Midwest, and then areas in the Intermountain West uh, may be too cold for spotted lanternfly to overwinter. However, there have been reports of eggs surviving uh, colder temperatures than seven degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so it's been thought, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, plant hosts in just a moment, but it has been thought that spotted lanternfly is likely to establish in areas where its preferred host, Alanthus or Tree of Heaven, is present. So assuming it can reach these um, areas on the west coast, and if ex exposed to the right uh, microclimates, it appears that this insect could potentially spread to much of the country. And then here, uh, grapes are another preferred host. And so this map identifies areas of high host, ac high host acreage uh, based on uh, the acreage of commercially grown uh, grape varieties. And you can see that grapes are grown really all over the country. Uh, and so again, it's like it's possible that this pest may uh, establish in um, um, a lot of the country. All right, so some, unlike some insects such as emerald ash borer that specializes on mostly just ash species, uh, this pest uh, um, is not nearly as selective when it comes to which plant species it will uh, feed on. They are known to feed on more than 70 different plant species from more than 20 different plant families. And as I've already indicated, they have a strong preference for tree of heaven, but they will also uh, feed uh, heavily on other plants, including uh, some of our important crops like our fruit trees, grapevines, hops, hardwood trees, and ornamentals. Uh, it does appear that host preferences may change as the, uh, the lanternfly matures. So researchers um, began noticing that the forest instar nymphs uh, were leaving other uh, trees to congregate on Tree of Heaven. So it was thought that Tree of Heaven um, is, is maybe a required host. Uh, but uh, it appears that some of the current research suggests that a spotted lanternfly can develop from first instar to adult on uh, some of these other hosts, not just Alanthus, but also uh, China berry, black walnut, butternut, um, also known as white uh, walnut, and some other hosts. So this insect uses a piercing sucking mouth part to feed on the phloem. And the phloem is basically the, the vascular tissue that's uh, responsible for the transport of, of sugars. Um, they are swarm feeders. So here you can see a, a big swarm um, on an apple tree. So as they feed, they excrete uh, large amounts of a sugary substance, which we call honeydew. And that honeydew attracts other pests, particularly uh, stinging insects like hornets and wasps, as well as uh, sooty mold, which is a, a gray black fungus. You can see it kind of down here. I'll show another picture in just a moment. Um, and then that sooty mold can then interfere with photosynthesis. And so uh, most of us are probably familiar with the honeydew that aphids uh, generate. Uh, but not um, quite in the, the quantity that this pest can um, excrete. So highly infested plants may uh, ooze sap, and you can see some of this sap oozing here. Uh, they may wilt. Uh, you may also see leaf curling and dieback. And then feeding uh, can also result in a decline in crop quality and yield, and then leave the plants uh, susceptible to uh, other uh, uh, stressors such as uh, the um, uh, winter stress. So here are two images. The one on the left is of a basal plant that's infested with, you can see the nymphs, and I'll go over identification in just a moment. Um, in most cases, uh, it sounds like uh, the, this insect will only feed on herbaceous plants for just a short period of time, but you can see the wilting on this, on this basal plant. And then here it is um, on the right is the damage of on a black walnut tree. 
Here are uh, some, I think these are red oak leaves and you can see some of the honeydew or the sticky residue building up here. And then eventually sooty mold will colonize those leaves, turning them black. And you can see uh, sooty mold on these leaves here. And then over here on the far left, you can see a, an adult spotted lanternfly. And then over here, you can see a larger infestation on the right. Uh, you can see these oozing wounds. And then down here, you can see this uh, sooty mold that's building up at the base of the tree. So sooty mold can also colonize the fruit. So this insect doesn't feed on the fruit itself, but um, the fruit can be uh, damaged. So here you can see a large infestation on grapes. And it's been noted that uh, grape growers in uh, some areas in Pennsylvania are applying um, around 14 more insecticide sprays to control for this pest and uh, yet they're still losing their crops. So this picture is from uh, Beekman Orchards in Berks County, Pennsylvania. And uh, this grower pretty much has lost everything. He treats his property, but unfortunately you can see in the background, there are a lot of other um, surrounding hosts. And so um, it's hard to control this pest when they can easily reinvade those treated fields. All right, so as far as the life cycle, um, they have uh, one generation per year. And I, I think I mentioned earlier that they overwinter as eggs. So let's start up here at the 12 o'clock position. So those eggs will hatch from about um, late April, early May uh, through early summer. And then those nymphs begin crawling and feeding on a wide range of host plants. They go through four instars, and you can see them here. Again, I'll go over identification in just a moment. And then by uh, midsummer or so, uh, mid to late July uh, um, is when they start to be uh, present. So about right now is when they're probably showing up in some areas. Uh, the adults are suspected to feed on only a few different host plants. I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Um, and then the females uh, feed for a few weeks before mating. And then um, they begin laying eggs from September to December, and then they die with a, with a, a, a hard frost. And uh, it's thought that each female can produce one to two egg masses, so uh, 30 to 100 uh, total eggs. So here I am Heather Millette, the risk analysis from, or the risk analyst from a USDA APHIS. Uh, PPQ s &T just sent me this earlier today. So this is a uh, spotted lanternfly nymph and adult emergence map. And so according to this um, model, they're looking at the A catch occurs at 200 uh, degree days. And you can see uh, this up here on the, on the top left. And they're using a lower uh, threshold temperature of 8.14 degrees Celsius, which is about 47 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not sure what their biofix is yet, but, um, but anyway, you can see this was a, a week ago. This map was, the map for today wasn't working. Um, but anyway, you can see that in these green areas, that's where the adults, if they do exist in those areas, uh, that's where they're, um, they're already showing up there. These blue areas indicate where um, the adult is expected to emerge um, sometime in the next month or so. And then here's uh, across the entire country. So if spotted lanternfly was in California, it's possible that the adults are starting to show up about right now. Okay, so as far as identification goes, um, uh, the males are a, a little smaller than the females. They're about five sixths of an inch in length. The females are about an inch long. Their head and legs are black. The yellow, uh, um, or sorry, the abdomen is yellow and it has these broad black bands. The four wings are uh, brownish gray. Uh, they have uh, spots on the four wings and then the wing tips have this network of veins and you can see it closer um, a close-up of that, of that wingtip here. 
Uh, the hind wings are uh, black and white anteriorly and red and bl with black spots uh, posteriorly. So this picture shows the wings open, but you, uh, if you see them in the, in the wild, you may only see open wings when they are flying or when they're startled. So you'll mostly see them um, here. You'll mostly see them like this with the wings closed. All right, as far as the nymphs go, uh, again, there are four instars. The first three instars are black with white spots. Uh, the first instars are about an eighth of an inch in length. The third instars are probably around three quarters of an inch in length. And then the fourth instars are red and black with white spots, and they are about three quarters of an inch in length. And so just a, a side note, uh, red coloration shown here on the fourth instar, as well as on the adult, that's a good indication to predators that they are toxic or that they don't taste good. So it's thought that this insect can pick up toxins from a tree of heaven and pass those on to predators. So here are the eggs. Uh, so the females will lay eggs in egg masses, and that egg mass is about one inch in length. So you can see an egg mass here and here, and then here are the actual eggs. So these are uncovered eggs. So the newly laid egg masses are white in color. You can see that on the, on the left side, but then they turn a brownish gray and mud-like as they age. So beneath this waxy covering, are the individual eggs. And uh, they're deposited in parallel rows. Um, and then each uh, egg mass contains about 30 to 50 individual eggs. And so going back to when I was talking about the life cycle, I had mentioned that the females can produce uh, about one to two egg masses. So again, that's about 30 to uh, 100 individual eggs. And she'll lay her eggs pretty much anywhere. So here they're laid on tree bark. Uh, landscaping stones here are four or five, looks like five egg masses here. Again, this is uh, um, the way that um, it's thought that they first arrived to uh, the U.S. is on um, landscaping stones as eggs. Here's another picture of uh, two egg masses on tree bark, and so these are look like they're uh, older egg masses. They'll also lay eggs on man-made objects. So here is um, several eggs on a, looks like a rusted fence post. And then um, here are some eggs down at the bottom on, the, uh, on this rusted barrel. They'll also lay eggs on outdoor furniture. So um, such as this, I don't know if it's a bench or a picnic table, uh, but it looks like there's a new egg mass here in the center. And then there's a couple of older uh, egg masses and it actually looks like the nymph emerged. You can see the emergence holes here. Uh, but they've also been observed uh, laying eggs on railway cars, vehicles, telephone poles, lots of different um, outdoor items. Um, so you can guess that uh, their egg masses, uh, if they're laying them everywhere and there are high infestations, they can be a, 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 so a nuisance pest to homeowners and in the ornamental and landscape industries. So again, they congregate in large numbers in and around homes and structures. So here are, is a, a very heavy infestation. I think this is a, a cherry tree. And then that honeydew that they produce um, can attract stinging insects such as this wasp on the right. Um, and then they can also, um, the honeydew will also coat items uh, below the affected trees where the, the lanternflies are feeding. So here you can see, um, <coughs> excuse me, it looks like a, a patio, some steps to a patio, and you can see the honeydew and the sooty mold that colonized this honeydew on the first two steps, and then the homeowner must have cleaned off the bottom step. So there are um, some lookalikes, so be aware of that. So the adult uh, may be mistaken for a, a garden tiger moth. Um, the, again, these are just examples. Um, and then the adults or the nymphs could be mistaken for, uh, these are green stink bug nymphs. And then down at the bottom uh, right are uh, milkweed bugs. 
Um, the egg masses can also be mistaken for either other insects or even, as I mentioned earlier, they appear mud-like as they mature. So for example, here are gypsy moth egg masses and they do look um, somewhat similar. And so this, uh, this is a nice publication that was released by uh, Virginia uh, Cooperative Extension. So if you suspect a uh, lanternfly, uh, just make sure you contact either your local extension office or your state department of agriculture. Okay, so Megan, this is the second um, um, uh, poll question. So could you launch this poll? So I'm just interested in knowing how many of you are concerned that this pest will uh, cause significant damage to your crops. I'm, tr I'm trying, sorry, there's a, okay, there we go. Here we go. All right, folks, go ahead and take this poll. We'll take about 20 seconds and you can chime in. How concerned are you that spotter and lanternfly will cause significant damage to crops, trees in your state? It's looking like somewhat concerned and very concerned are in the lead. So we have 425 people on the webinar and 320 have voted. So go ahead and take a few more seconds to chime in before we Go ahead and close the poll. Somewhat concerned, 52% is in the lead. So a few more seconds and then we're gonna end the poll. And can you see that? Okay. Yeah, so it uh, looks like 52% somewhat concerned and 33% are very concerned. I think it would have been interesting to see um, uh, if you were where you're at and what your, yeah. uh, your answer. Was. I think it probably would vary geologically or geographically for sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, seeing this insect in person, I'm on the very concerned um, uh, sphere. So, all right. So, moving on. So, uh, as far as pathways of spread, uh, this insect can move a few miles on their own. Um, the adults are, um, can fly short distances, but the adults and nymphs uh, can, can also walk and jump. Um, but unfortunately, they are common hitchhikers at all life stages. Uh, but the adults and the egg masses are probably the most common life stages that will be uh, moved from infested uh, to uninfested areas. And so these <clears throat> possible pathways uh, include uh, vehicles, landscaping stones, as we've already talked about, road and building construction materials, such as bricks and pipes, and machinery, plants, uh, wood products, including firewood. So here you can see these are fourth instar nymphs on um, uh, some type of vehicle. And then here you can see an inspector inspecting these um, landscaping stones. And again, um, that is the, the pathway that it is thought to have, um, uh, is thought that they first arrived to the country as eggs on landscaping stones. So I think it's going to um, take a, a village in a sense to um, prevent this pest from spreading to, to new areas and to control this pest. So um, in Pennsylvania, they have recruited master gardeners to help with uh, some of their surveys. And so I'll go over more about traps in just a moment. There's a big emphasis on public education right now. The Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture put together these signs. Um, this is, a, I took this picture when I was at one of the hotspots in Pennsylvania. Um, USDA has come up with some really clever uh, um, campaigns about what this pest, uh, the risk that this pest poses, the risk that this pest poses. Uh, so again, their uh, hops as a host is, as uh, are uh, the wine grapes. And so our uh, wine and beer um, uh, could eventually be uh, um, affected. And then I know we're uh, trying to raise awareness in our state. So these are just some of the things that we've done, but I know other states on the West Coast have, have, have released publications. So this on the far left is just a, a fact sheet that we put together. And then we reach out a lot to our master gardeners because they were the ones that detected a Japanese beetle and a brown marmorated state in, um, a brown marmorated stink bug in our state. 
So we reach out to them and we um, give them, um, um, uh, they attend a workshop and we give them uh, this guide. And then we even talk about the threat that um, firewood, uh, the dangers of moving firewood. And so we ask them to wear this shirt. Uh, so that helps raise awareness of the, these pathways. Okay, so as far as monitoring for spotted lanternfly, um, <clears throat> so Tree of Heaven, since it's such a preferred host, it can be used as a sentinel host plant. And so that's one way that um, people are uh, looking for this pest in new areas. And then these sticky uh, tree bands are another useful monitoring tool. Uh, so spotted lanternfly, especially the early instars, uh, move up and down the host plant on, a, on pretty much a daily basis as they feed. So these sticky bands are used to capture the, the lantern flies as they're climbing up the tree. Uh, and so you can see a bunch of the first or second or third instars here, but it appears that the banding is more effective against the nymphal stages, especially the early nymphal stages, uh, since the adults and probably the fourth instars uh, could either avoid the tape or um, uh, they may even be able to break through that adhesive. So there's been some research um, in looking into the different traps that are um, that are available. And so uh, preliminary data shows that this bug barrier tree band uh, shown here on the left, it basically has an inward facing uh, sticky band and I'll show a, a zoomed in view in just a moment. But a preliminary research has shown that uh, this band is actually more effective at capturing spotted lanternfly than uh, these sticky bands. And then this band um, also uh, reduced non-target capture. So ev evidently bycatch is really common on these uh, sticky bands, including um, birds and small mammals like squirrels. And so here's a zoomed in uh, picture of that bug barrier tree band. And so as I mentioned, there's an inward facing uh, sticky trap. And so I don't know if those are, are spotted lantern flies or what, but uh, so it's sticky on the inside. And then there's this foam on um, the inside that as the nymphs climb up the tree, this foam prevents them from climbing up any further. And then the sticky, so they get st stuck on the sticky part of, of the band. And then some other uh, possible traps that researchers are, um, are looking into include circle traps and modified coculio traps. So <clears throat> researchers have identified uh, three host plant volatiles that are associated with Tree of Heaven and appear to be attractive to spotted lanternfly in the lab, uh, but produced mixed results in the field studies. So for example, methyl salicylate, uh, the first instars appear to be attracted to that volatile in the lab, but um, they were not attracted to the other two volatiles shown here. But in the field, uh, the first instars were attracted to um, this third uh, compound. So now um, uh, uh, researchers, and I show, here's uh, the, the paper that I'm uh, referencing um, they're now looking at using methyl salicylate or combinations of attractive uh, plant volatiles for uh, monitoring purposes. Okay, moving on to non-chemical control. Um, so uh, one uh, option includes removing the invasive tree of heaven. Uh, however, an, an herbicide application may need to accompany the, the removal of Tree of Heaven since uh, small pieces of, of uh, remaining root can uh, generate uh, new shoots. Egg masses can also be scraped. So you can see in this picture, they're scraping an egg mass and you can use a credit card, a putty knife, or, or some um, another similar type of tool. And so these egg masses <clears throat> should be scraped into a vial containing uh, rubbing alcohol or, or hand sanitizer. And then they can also be uh, smashed or burned. And remember that the egg masses are gonna be uh, present from around September uh, to May. So make sure to watch for those uh, this coming fall. Um, 
And then uh, research has also found that chipping of egg infested wood um, was sufficient at killing um, uh, spotted lanternfly eggs. So uh, biological control. So uh, predation of, of this insect is occurring in the wild and you can see pictures such as these such as these on the internet. So here's a picture of a predatory stink bug and then a praying mantis. I've seen pictures of ants and, and spiders as well. So predation is occurring, but evidently not at the levels high enough for um, long-term dependable control. And so right now it appears that the emphasis is on uh, parasitoids and pathogens. And so I've listed three different parasitoids that they're looking at. Um, the first is, an, is actually the, um, an Asian egg parasitoid that was introduced into our country in 1908 uh, to control gypsy moth. And so they have uh, been finding um, uh, this, this parasitoid uh, attacking spotted lanternfly eggs in Pennsylvania. But at this point, it appears that the uh, parasitism levels are relatively low. I think it was around 7%. So the second wasp, Anastatus orientalis, is an, another Asian uh, egg parasitoid, and it appears that it has a higher level of egg parasitism. Um, I think it was between 30 and 40 percent, and it is in quarantine for further study to see if it will attack any of our um, native, uh, native insects um, and could potentially be allowed to uh, be released in, um, in the future. And then this third parasitoid, um, I believe, is also in quarantine. And it's not an egg parasitoid, it's an ectoparasitoid that attacks the second to the third instar nymphs. Um, whoops, I mean to do that. And then um, moving on to the pathogens. So uh, there have been two North American fungal pathogens have been identified. And interestingly, I just sat in on a webinar the other day about spotted lanternfly, and it appears that these uh, pathogens may be partitioning the habitat. So researchers noticed that the spotted lanternflies that were dead on the ground um, tended to be attacked mostly by uh, Bavaria bassiana, um, which is already an ingredient in some EPA approved um, biopesticides. Uh, but these, uh, the dead lanternflies that were remaining on the tree trunks were mostly killed by Batcoa major. Um, I think it was around 97% of the, of the lantern flies were killed by this pathogen. So this pathogen is really interesting because it acts as a, a sort of a mind controlling parasite, parasite uh, that uh, modifies its host behavior. So for example, it might uh, force um, or compel the lantern fly to climb up a tree and then um, the lanternfly attaches to the tree, um, uh, its final hosting place, and then the spores will uh, burst out of the insect's body to rain down on uh, some of the remaining lanternflies that are, uh, are below. So it's thought that that uh, modification in the host behavior uh, may help them spread and infect even more uh, insects. Laurie? Yes. I'm fascinated by this. Okay, so how, you said that that Bact, Bactota, whatever, um, is in, it's being tested right now, or? So they're, they noticed it infesting some of the lanternflies in, I think it was Pennsylvania. And so specimens were sent off to researchers at Cornell University and they've identified both of those as uh, pathogens that are affecting uh, this, um, the lanternfly. Wow, okay. And so, yeah, it's really, it's really cool. Um, here's another example where, um, in this case, it's forced the lanternfly uh, to open its wings, and then it, the spores are developing here, here on the abdomen, so here it's forced the wings to open. And then again, the spores are developing here, and then uh, the spores will be uh, shot off the abdomen, 
but the wings are not blocking the spores from being shot off into the environment. And so I thought that that was really interesting. Um, as far as I know, those are the only two pathogens, but there might be some others that they're looking at. Okay, so moving on to chemical control. Uh, so research has shown that all uh, life stages of spotted lanternfly are susceptible to insecticides, including the eggs. So um, the most effective uh, oviside that was tested for ornamentals was this JM, sorry, I think this should be JMS Stylet Oil, uh, which is a mineral oil-based product, and it offered, uh, I think, around 70% uh, mortality of the egg masses um, at a rate of 3%. And then these contact insecticides um, also appear to be effective, especially by fenthrin and carbaryl. And uh, both of those appear to also have good residual activity. Um, and then these systemic insecticides um, also work, appear to be uh, working well. Uh, they have good residual activity, so they last from uh, several weeks to several months. Um, I, the systemic insecticides are really only recommended though in areas where um, there are high populations of spotted lanternfly or high value trees. So these, um, and I should back up, the, if you're interested in learning more about these, I recommend that you um, look at either this uh, fact sheet that's really the um, Penn State Extension uh, put together, that's where I'm getting my information from. And then there's also a, um, a, a journal article um, uh, that uh, was just released not too long ago that uh, evaluates those insecticides. So uh, systemic insecticides, um, there are basically three methods to apply them. So tree injection, uh, bark sprays, or soil drenches. And the tree injection um, with dinotefiran has been uh, successful at killing uh, spotted lanternfly, I think in a variety of tree species. And uh, death usually occurs um, with, uh, within 24 hours. Um, but certainly injections with imidacloprid have also been uh, evaluated uh, with good success. And then there are bark or trunk sprays. Um, and so dinotefiran um, has been successful. Uh, death usually isn't as fast as it is with uh, the tree injections, but it, it usually occurs within just a few days. And then uh, lastly, soil drenches, but I don't think um, there's a, uh, the effectiveness of the soil drench applications, I think at this point is uh, unknown, uh, partly because the uh, uh, insecticide needs time to be taken up by, the, um, by the, the tree roots. And so if you go to that uh, Penn State Extension fact sheet, they do offer a, a, a nice table um, that uh, goes over the different insecticides, or at least the, the active ingredients, um, how effective they are, so their activity against spotted lanternfly, as well as their residual activity, um, and then how toxic they are, uh, the way to apply those insecticides, and then uh, the timing. And so then they also uh, provide this nice table of uh, what you should be doing at what time of the year. So. Um, you know, if, if these, uh, these contact sprays are going to be more effective um, when the adults and nymphs are active. You're not going to want to spray those earlier in the year where you just see the, uh, the egg masses. Uh, finally, um, the use of trap trees uh, has been recommended in, in some areas. Uh, the strategy here basically involves uh, removing um, some, but not all the trees, and um, I'm referring to the, the tree of heaven especially. So they go in and they remove some, but not all the trees, and then they use targeted insecticide sprays on the, um, the remaining tree or trees. Uh, and so these spotted lanternflies that are then congregated around this one tree uh, will die after ingesting the insecticide. So uh, male trap trees are preferred over female trap trees because the, um, at least uh, with Tree of Heaven, the females are producing seeds 
which can uh, repopulate the property. And again, if, if you do remove trees, um, the tree of heaven, it's recommended that you um, also use an herbicide because you don't want the, the roots, um, leftover roots to generate these shoots. Uh, but I was just reading the other day that in some areas, um, uh, they're not recommending the removal of Tree of Heaven uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one, uh, Tree of Heaven is, as I mentioned earlier, is a valuable tool for um, monitoring low level populations or for first detections of, of this insect. And then uh, there are questions as to whether um, Tree of Heaven is required uh, for it uh, required by spotted lanternfly to complete their life cycle. Um, and then also if uh, removing tree of heaven uh, will send spotted lanternfly to other um, more desirable plants such as grapes because we don't want them moving onto our grapes. Um, but again, um, I recommend that you look at a lot of other resources. Uh, there are the, um, uh, the Penn State researchers and others are the ones that are um, working with this pest um, hands-on. And so one uh, recommendation is to go to the Northeastern IPM Center website and you can get through that through two different ways. So stop LSF. Um, and then uh, I think I mentioned earlier that there are several webinars out there that you can uh, go um, listen to. Uh, and here are here are those that are associated with the Northeastern IPM Center. And then again, Penn State Extension and Pennsylvania Department of Ag. Um, there are several other resources out there. And so with that, um, I wanna thank you. And it looks like there are a lot of questions, so we can work our way through those. Yes, do you wanna click on the Q&A window? Can you see it? Yep. If you click on that and just scroll to the top, um, and some of these questions come in throughout your talk, so if, if they've already been addressed, feel free to just quickly click off of them. I put those links um, that you had just on your last slide in the chat window, so if anybody wants to grab those links, you can cut and paste from the chat window. You can't cut and paste in the Q&A window. It's annoying, but it's a Zoom thing. Okay, so I hope I can answer some of these questions. Again, I'm relying on um, the uh, research by uh, the Penn State and other sources. Um, but it looks like the first question is, what is the ecological purpose of the spotted lanternfly? Um, it, scroll to the top. Oh, no. Robert Hoff had, oh, you got to, so okay. click in the Q&A and then you'll be able, oh. Okay. Use your mouse. Yeah, go over there. Does, okay. the life, does the life cycle differ in tropical environments? Are multiple generations possible? Um, as far as I know, I think I'm not really sure, honestly. I think it's similar. Um, I, I've only read that there's one generation, um, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not positive. And some people that might be um, experts on this pest could be on the webinar. So if you have anything to chime in, go ahead and um, stick that in the chat window so we can see it. Um, okay. Um, do you want me to read the question? Yeah. Okay, Lawrence asks, is there any less chance okay. of the nymphs surviving when the eggs are laid on man-made objects or will the nymphs be able to crawl to food sources? So the nymphs can crawl to new food sources. Um, I have not heard anything about the nymphs um, having a less chance of survival on uh, man-made, or sorry, the nymphs no, I th yeah, I think the nymphs can crawl to new food sources. So and now if there are, if the egg masses are in areas um, where there's not a lot of host, then yeah, it's possible that the nymphs won't survive. Okay. Mar so. Marguerite, I'll read the question and you can sort of process it. Marguerite says, this insect reminds me of gypsy moth and I wonder if there are similar control recommendations for homeowners things like scraping off egg masses, trapping larvae. I guess you, you did talk about that towards the end of your yeah, talk. Yeah, and I think that I, that was probably, yeah, it looks like that was uh, asked while I was talking, but yeah. So scraping off egg masses, um, there are no, um, uh, they can't um, uh, spread the, or spray um, like the whole area. 
um, like they did for Gypsy Moth. Uh, just for those of you on the webinar right now, I just launched an evaluation poll. So before you tune out, please go ahead and um, answer that for us. Um, okay. Ecological purpose of the spotted lanternfly. Do they have any natural predators? And you did talk about the that towards the end. Um, yeah. So they uh, that's thought that why they um, their numbers or they're not a big problem in their native range is because of the the native natural enemies. And then, um, sorry, what was that? Was the first part of that question? Uh, ecological purpose. Okay, so actually, I'm not really sure about that other than I did read, it was really interesting that at one point, uh, they were cons uh, considering using a spotted lantern flight to help control tree of heaven. And, uh, but then the powers that be decided against that because of the broad host range. And so, yeah, so they're, um, they evidently do kill a tree of heaven, which is another invasive. Um, right, which yes, Mike Coons would be happy about. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so Luke asked a specific question. Um, where's the three to four miles per movement number come from. So sometimes after these webinars, um, I have the speakers send out a list of um, like resources. So if you had a link to that paper that you referred, um, I'll put that in an email that I can send to everybody and then that can be referenced. Yep, yep. I that can, sound good? I can, okay. I can do that. I'll remind you about that. Glenn asked about chemical treatments such as insecticidal soap and you did address that towards the end of your talk. And yeah, so some of the dormant oils um, can work on uh, some of the eggs, um, uh, but yeah. And Teresa asked about quarantine protocols that are in place currently in Pennsylvania. Um, I'm not really sure. I just know that there's that, uh, that quarantine has been set up, but I'm not sure what the actual protocols are. Glenn's just made a general comment. I'm thinking a traditional canker worm band might work for the nymph stage as well. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything about the canker worm band if that's the um, if, if that's similar to the um, the bug barrier bands that they're using. I'm not familiar with the canker worm band. Sorry. Some people might be so. Um, yeah, feel free to put that information in the chat window. Um, Alexander, are there any training mounts of this fly and its nymphs available? Where are the guide, where's the guide literature available? So some of the links, Alexander, that she referenced are in the chat window. And then any additional ones that we think might be useful, I'll send those out in an email, but. Yep. Um, as far as the training mounts of, of the lantern fly, um, I'm not really sure about that. Um, I know I do have specimens, but I'm not sure how or if you can access them. Um, I would say like your local extension. Yeah. You know, um, Tara asked, can I get a copy of that first detector publication? So can we put that? Yes, it okay. is online. And so uh, you can access that online. If you probably just Google first detector Utah guide, it'll probably show up. Um, if you're interested in a bound copy, uh, you can go ahead and email me. My email is shown I think it should be shown on the slide still. Yeah, and if people want to move that poll out of the way or minimize it, you could easily do that if you want to see her email. Yeah, so I'd be happy to send a guide out, a, a bound copy out to anyone. Oh, cool. I'm just taking notes, so go ahead and go through the questions if you want. Okay, yeah, it looks like people are asking about natural predators, natural enemies. Um, and so I, I went over that. I think that was probably asked before I started talking about that. Tara, why don't you go ahead and email Lori for that? Okay, done there. Um, Natural controls in where they came from, which was China, right? Uh, yeah, so yeah, they've already talked about that. There are some of those Asian parasitoids um, that seem to be check, uh, keeping them in check. Uh, and, and I think at least two of them are here in quarantine uh, right now in the U.S., but they haven't been approved for release yet. Are you familiar with how they interact with humans in any way as far as they're not dangerous or? 
um, well, they're not going to bite and they're not going to sting. Um, I heard uh, that they are poisonous, but I'm not, I can't, I haven't confirmed that. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if they're used in any type of medical research. Do they feed on coniferous tree species? I believe so, yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Rolling through, we got 11 questions left. So the climate Climate zone discussion was somewhat confusing. It sounds like there is potential for spread in most locations due to microclimates, I thought. Um, do you have any clarifications on that, Lori? Yeah, so given, um, um, especially the host range, so Tree of Heaven and grapes, and because it's, it has a broad host range, I think my point was that it could potentially spread to, um, uh, throughout the country. Um, I don't know a lot of information about the um, temperature requirements yet. Um, so we did have, uh, they do have some, there's been some work done and I showed a map about uh, degree day requirements for uh, egg hatch. Um, but I, I, I think that still, there's still a lot of, um, they're still working through that about the climates that are more suitable for this insect. And are the controls specific to the kind of um, host or could the controls be translated from the tree host to gr grapes um, or does um, it matter? Well, it has to be registered, whatever the control that you're using, it has to be registered on that crop. Um, so not all products will be registered on all, all uh, trees. So you, it's important to make sure you read the labels. Um, Specifically, what would you recommend for grapes, or do you not? Uh, so Pennsylvania, um, the Penn State Extension has, um, so that fact sheet that I showed that Penn State Extension produced, they actually have one that's specific for grapes. So I, met, I recommend that they go to, the, um, uh, to this website shown here on the slide. Awesome. I don't know how you pronounce that. Can you bury the... You see that one from Tim Russell? Imidacloprid? Imidacloprid. Can you bury um, the imidacloprid tablets, like what is done around hemlock roots to treat? I'm not sure about that. No. Okay. Um, Ruth says these insecticides are toxic to pollinators. Any suggestions for using them in ways that will reduce impact to pollinators? Okay, so I was wondering if this was gonna come up, so I actually did include, uh, there's this paper that's released, I'm sh sharing it right now, it's in Journal of Economic Entomology. Um, they did look at whether uh, honeybees that might be visiting the, the honeydew um, on um, the honeybees uh, visiting trees that were treated with dioteferan, um, whether that uh, translates into um, whether that insecticide is, can be picked up in the wax or the honey. Um, and they did not find, they found detectable levels of dioteferan in the honeydew um, produced by the lanternflies, but they did not find uh, detectable levels in the, um, the worker bees, the wax, or uh, the honey. But I still, I think there's still a lot of interest, obviously, in uh, pollinator uh, impacts on pollinators. And so um, at this point, that's all I really know. I just put the link to that paper in the chat window. Okay. So you're good to go there. If people want that paper, go for it. How likely is spotted lanternfly treatment to go the way of the emerald ash borer? Currently, it feels like many state governments have given up on stopping it. Um, yeah, so there's a discussion on whether they're uh, going to deregulate emerald ash borer. Um, and I think the, the, the reason is because it's uh, widespread, at least on, um, on the Midwest and the East Coast. Um, but I'm not sure about uh, uh, treatment com comparisons between uh, the two insects, because um, they each kind of um, work a little bit differently. I'm not really sure. 
A canker worm band has fiberglass insulation. Oh, this is the canker worm band description. Underneath, a band of plastic to prevent the crawling insects from getting underneath it, secured by duct tape with a sticky substance on the top side. Do you think that would work? Yeah, it sounds like it's similar to that bug barrier band. Cool. If I'm understanding it correctly, yeah. Um, Glenn was wondering, she thought, he thought you mentioned it being on poinsettias. Is that, did you mention that or? Yeah, so in Massachusetts, a uh, evidently a homeowner found a dead spotted lanternfly on a potted poinsettia. And I think I read that the poinsettia was, um, uh, came from a grower in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure if it, um, the exact, you know, who, who sent it, but uh, yes, it appears that they were on some poinsettias. Did you show a list of trees that was the most preferred, um, like a from most preferred to least preferred in your no, but Okay. A lot of those extension resources that I keep citing uh, list them. But, okay. um, and then if you go to that stop lsf.org, it'll take you to the uh, Northeastern IPM Center and they have a list of known hosts there. Awesome. We got through all the questions and we still have 300 people. So if you haven't, oh, you, everybody's voted. Um, thank you so much, Lori, for such an informative webinar. This webinar was recorded and it will be available um, by the end of the week, likely by tomorrow. So keep an eye out on our website for a link to that recording. And Lori will send me a list of the pertinent citations that um, folks were asking about multiple times. And so I'll send out a quick email that sort of describes those things uh, with the link to the recording. And then you guys can share and, and share your knowledge and um, stay on top of this pest. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.